Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today it's Lost March's turn to get its deck profile for Lost Thunder. It's one that I'm sure a lot of people are excited about. It does of course hop back to Night March, a deck that was loved and hated universally for like a whole season pretty much as just a big beat down non-GX deck. And there are similarities here to take from that old deck, so let's jump into the basic concept. And it really is the most simple one in the book, really. We're going to use the Lost Zone, the mechanic that's sort of coming back in this set, or has been recently coming back with um, Prism Star cards. Now being used in a different light, we're going to try and fill our Lost Zone with as many Pokemon as possible, because that's going to increase our damage output with our Natus and our Jump Bluffs. And then using those little... Um, non-GX attackers. We're going to look to reach one-hit KOs and simply win a prize race. That is the most simple um, strategy known in Pokemon right now, using non-GXs to swing hard and take fast knockouts and just outright race the opponents. So, pretty tried and tested strategy. Let's see if we can pull it off. Starting off with the Pokemon here, we're going to play a 4-4 line of Jump Bluff. It's not often that you see Stage 2 lines carry out this sort of line, but it's because the Skip Bloom is integral to getting the Jump Bluff into play in the first place. It has the Flower Way in the Sky ability. I guess that's what uh, Limitless have translated it as. Huge shout out for them for the proxies, by the way. It may be different in English when it finally comes out, but once during a turn, you may search your deck for a Jump Bluff, then put this Pokemon and all cards attached to it to the Lost Zone, and then put the chosen Jump Bluff into play instead. So um, this is fantastic. It essentially means that Jump Bluff acts as a stage one as long as it's in your deck. So that is something important to note. Prizing pieces of this line in particular is very, very awkward. Um, prizing any of your hopips means obviously you can't build up any higher, but prizing your skip plumes is going to mean you can't get your jump bluffs. And jump bluffs being prized or in your hand are both going to be big issues for you because you need them physically in the deck so that you can use that ability of the skip plume and then put it into the active or in place the skip plume, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, another big note on the Skip Bloom is that it has 60 hit points and free retreat. Both of these things are insane. Jump Bluff also has that free retreat. But being 60 HP means you can search out with Professor Elm's lecture, and that's absolutely huge and is a big reason why we can get set up fairly quickly on turn two by going turn one Elm into turn two Elm is the dream, or just a combination of getting lots of Hoppips down and then lots of Skip Blooms down with some use of Elm either on turn one or two. Pretty much is going to be the way that we get multiples of these uh, into play, which then throw themselves into the Lost Zone and start becoming damage. Of course, the Hoppip gets thrown in there as well, so each Skip Bloom you evolve into and pull out the Jump Bluff, uh, that's going to be 40 damage for you. So, realistically, we want to have like maybe three Skip Blooms uh, thrown into the Discard Pile. Oh, sorry, not the Discard Pile, the Lost Zone, uh, so that we can do 120 and then use things like Trumbeaks and Lost Mixers to get us the rest of the way. That's pretty much what we look to do. If ever you have a game where you get four Jump Bluffs out, uh, you're really happy. It's just very rare that that's going to come out uh, frequently for you. We do have three copies of Natu as well. It also has the Lost March attack, same as the Jump Bluff. Um, it's just Natu attacks for a double colorless energy instead. The Jump Bluff acts for just one Grass energy, which is cool because that's also searchable with Netball, which we're obviously going to be playing in this deck. Then we have the four Trumbeaks. I just mentioned it. It's another way that we can ramp damage. Whenever you see it, you're really happy to find it because you can simply use this ability from your hand and put it straight into the Lost Zone. So whenever you see it, it's like finding a double plus power. You just chuck it into the Lost Zone and that's ready to go. But also there's the upside of being able to look at your opponent's top card of their deck. If it's a supporter, you can put it into their Lost Zone as well. So... Um, it means that they can sometimes be cheesed out of a draw supporter here and there, or even a Guzma or something like that, which is, you know, a nice little factor to keep them dead drawing if they're in a bad spot. But it also gives you information. You know what they're drawing into next turn. They don't get to see the card, only you do. It's not a reveal, it's a look at. So do bear that in mind. Uh, then we have two copies of Tapu Lele GX, obviously going to be huge. I've already mentioned Professor Elm's Lecture being a big card in the deck. Searching out that is going to be fantastic for you. Also going to play one copy of a low and Volpix. I think this is a huge card for the deck, to be honest. I've seen certain lists play it and certain lists not play it. But I think, as I just mentioned, the Hoppip is integral for getting into your Skip Blooms, which are integral for your damage output overall. So whenever you lead a Hoppip, you want to retreat out of there as early as possible. And having a target like a low and Volpix is going to be insane for you. It is, once again, 
a Professor Elms searchable option for you. You can then start using Beacon as well if you've gone second. So simply protecting a Hopip is a huge deal in this deck because it is your main means of ramping damage. So having something good to retreat into, especially something that can attack for free with Beacon, is going to be a great deal for you. I think it's a really important card. And we're already playing two copies of Choice Band and DCs. So you can even use its uh, attack Icy Snow or Icy Wind. I can't remember what it is. I've covered it up with the little number one there. But it does 20 for a DCE. And if you're against Bacephalon, you can do 100 for a DCE with the Choice Band attached. So even that can be pressure. And this deck doesn't normally get damage on the board on the early turns because Lost March is doing such pitiful damage. Like Natu is going to be doing a certain amount just based on like finding one or two early Trum Beaks. But usually there's not much pressure coming down at all. There's a low and Volpix can change that, especially against Blacephalon, so do bear that in mind. One copy of a Rangaroo as well. We have a lot of Instaplay item cards. We also have Ultra Ball and Lost Mixer. Both of these are reducing your hand size greatly, making Instruct a real great option for us to keep our hand size fresh. And it just adds to the total amount of Pokemon that we play in the deck for options with Lost Mixer as well. So... Oftentimes you have to be careful. You may want to hold it into your hand longer than usual in other games or with other decks You just put the Aranguru down when you feel like you need the card draw at times You may want to hold on to the guru just in case it can be lost mix it away Later down the line, but in general having extra card draw is another great option for this deck On to the item cards now. We're gonna play two copies of a rescue stretcher I think it's again all about the hop hips really if you can recover those pieces of the line if they do start to get knocked out, that's going to be a huge deal for you. And again, trying to mitigate that prizing issue that I've already mentioned. If there's a jump luff that you're just waiting to proc the ability on, but you've got to wait for a jump luff to get knocked out, you get the jump luff knocked out, you stretch it back into the deck so Skip Bloom can use its ability, and then you've got yourself that 40 damage all over again, and just pulled out the jump luff for free. So uh, Stretcher, a really big card for maintaining the amount of damage that we can have throughout the game. Then we're going to play two copies of Great Ball. I prefer this to Timer Ball, personally. Uh, I know that's what a lot of the Japanese lists were playing, but um, I think this is a better early game option for, again, getting more Pokemon down. It actually gives us a higher chance of hitting Elm Turn 1 as well, theoretically, because we can access Lele's, um, or even things like Orangaroo for extra draws randomly here or there. But um, in general, I like this a little better than Timer Ball, but that's pretty much the slot that it's taking right now. Three copies of Locksmith's uh, Lost Mixer, a new card. Uh, from the set, it allows you to put two cards from your hand straight into the Lost Zone, and then you simply draw one card. Obviously weak as a draw option, but it's all about trying to ramp more damage. Chucking excess Pokemon that do land in your hand in there is going to be reasonable for you. You can throw those excess Jump Luffs straight into the Lost Zone if you feel like you're not going to be able to recycle them in any other way. And in general, those excess Lele's and whatnot, the Volpix, if you don't feel like it's worth it, for example, if you've gone first, sometimes you don't feel like you want to do that. Uh, you can just start chucking those away. Or in general, get rid of excess supporter cards or item cards that you're not using at the time uh, to reduce your hand size to then get the one draw from the item itself, but also instruct draws it can gain you as well. So I think three copies is fine for the majority of the time. Looking at Japanese lists, it was between three. Uh, often there were a handful that were played four, but there are even teched out lists that only played two. So I feel like three is probably going to be the standard that we see being set for these decks, unless you have a much thicker Pokemon line. For example, I've seen some lists playing like a full four copies of Lele and four copies of Natu, and sometimes two copies of Orangaroo. I've seen all sorts of different builds uh, for this deck, and it really has been intriguing to try and nail the best list here. Um, but Lost Mixer feels like a good three of, unless you're going over the top on Pokemon physically anyway. From there, I'm going to play four copies of Netball. It's a phenomenal card. It's amazing for searching out Hoppips, as well as finding your grass energies. It allows us to be very cheeky with our energy count and get away with it because we have these extra outs via the Netballs. And then we're also going to play four copies of Ultra Ball. Honestly, the discards are frustrating because you don't really want to get rid of, like, anything in the deck <laughs> a lot of the time. Um... But it's about finding those Lele's for Elms early. It's about getting into your Skip Blooms quickly as well. So it is an important card for the deck. But it is frustrating having these discards because there's not much you want to bin in all honesty. Then there are two copies of Choice Band. This again helps us ramp. Puts a little bit less pressure on us going crazy with the Lost Zone. Puts a little bit less pressure on us getting that many Skip Blooms out straight away. Uh, we're hoping as well in certain matchups that our Grass Typing and Psychic Typing that we have can hit for weakness on certain things like... Buzzwalls and Lycanrocks and all that good stuff. So, um, 
oftentimes we don't need to fully commit to the lost zone like obviously that's going to be our game plan but don't feel bad if you've only got like two jump bluffs out in play and you've only found like two trombeaks early sometimes with choice band that can reach the numbers that you're looking for especially if you've had early pokes with like natu and stuff so yeah choice band is going to be really helpful for when we don't have quite the optimal setup and helping us reach those numbers Onto the supporters now. I've gone fairly standard. Uh, two copies of Lily alongside three copies of Guzma. Four Professor Elms Lecture is the new supporter card, which lets you search your deck for three Pokemon with 60 hit points or less, which is obviously amazing for your Hoppips. Going to be great for getting Natu and uh, a low on Volpix as well. So really big deal there. And of course, it gets you Skip Blooms. So the four count is not only to use it on turn one, but it's also for turn two if you have the chance as well. And from there, four copies of Cynthia for some nice shuffle draw throughout the game as well. It is a little bit skimpy on the supporter line, um, but that's just the nature of the deck. We're using a lot of items in here to try and motor through as quickly as possible. Having the additional draws of the Lily and the Cynthia throughout the game are gonna be nice to keep us rolling though, because we don't play that many energy cards, and even with Netball, uh, we need to keep cycling for those more than anything when we do reach the late game. Speaking of energy, we're just playing seven total. Again, it is very cheeky and on the low side, but we do have those uh, netballs to give us extra outs for the grass energies at the very least. And uh, DC going to be great for Lele, retreating a Rangaroo and attacking with your Natus as well. So bear that in mind. It also means that we can attach over onto a Shuckle as well. I know Shuckle is a big issue for the deck. I'm not playing Super Boost in here. But theoretically, you can attach DC onto DCE, onto Natus and start swinging. But obviously, that's not going to be a great idea for you, especially because they have such low hit points and they'll die to Shuckle's poison. But if there if there are decks just teching one Shuckle, you theoretically still can get over them just by double attaching DCEs. It's just really expensive. Onto the full list. I got on a little tangent there. But yeah, pause now if you want to uh, see the breakdown there. And it's going to be in the description as always as well. Onto tech options now, I did just mention Super Boost. If you're worried about opposing Shuckles and losing to those, you can obviously play Super Boost. I don't really like it because you need to have three Jump Bluffs out in play anyway, so um, that's already like a best case scenario type card, and in all other situations, it's unusable, so I feel like it's pretty weak. A Shuckle GX of your own could be good for mirror matches if you really felt like you wanted to improve that matchup, whereas you know, usually in a mirror it would just be trying to race and see who's more consistent. The Shuckle can give you a much higher win rate. Um, playing Let Loose Marshadows as well could be a pretty cool option. I've experimented with going like Mysterious Treasures with a higher Lele count and like one or two Marshadows. I know there was a Japanese list floating around with that. Um, and I can see it working out as well. I feel like that's not a bad option. Let Loose giving you some disruption for the opponent as well as extra draws for you because this deck can function on a fairly low hand size. I've also seen a couple of lists incorporating Countercatcher and reducing your Guzma count again, allowing you to have more insta-play cards and more cards that are like pretty binnable pretty much to play more into the sort of Lost Mixer and Instruct sort of theme of the deck. And it's more like Persimian-esque where we start off slow and eventually ramp into one hit KO. So the Countercatcher, seeing as though you can draw into those whilst also finding energy cards at the same time is going to be a good deal. Because you are a glass cannon deck at the end of the day, and there are going to be those spots where you can't Guzma because you also need to find yourself an energy that turn. And it's going to be frustrating for you. The counter catcher could be incorporated if you want to reduce your Guzma count to two and make a space for a second counter catcher that could definitely go into the deck. Final thought from me is that I don't really like Super Boost as a card in this deck. Alolan Muck, however, could be a physical Pokemon that in every matchup where you're not against Shuckle, it can be 20 damage if you use it with Loss Mixer, or you can just Ultra Ball it away or whatever. Uh, and Machoke is also a stage one Pokemon that's very interesting and could help out the biggest flaw of this deck is that we are full of glass cannons. The um, Natu has 40 hit points and Jumpluff has 70, so spread is naturally a horrendous matchup for us. Uh, so if, you, we were, if we were to play a single copy of Ditto Prism Star, a single copy of Muck and Machoke, in theory, we could tech for the Shuckle and the uh, spread matchups. Um, the biggest downside to this is obviously Ditto doesn't count for the Lost March damage output because it's a Prism Star. So that's annoying. It then becomes like the most dead card in the deck out of anything else. Um, and also, like, both the Alolan Muck and the Machoke can be dealt with quite easily. And once they're dealt with, 
then the stuff that was beating you will still beat you. So I feel like overall, we just want to remain consistent. I did, however, experiment with this and I thought it was worth noting. Onto the overall matchup overview. I think the Decidueye variants, the Ninetales especially, but also the Zoroark build will be quite awkward for you, especially if they start getting their Decidueyes online. And let's face it, this deck isn't quite as aggressive as Night March used to be. Uh, people actually have time to evolve their stuff against you, which is really bad for the deck because it means the Glass Cannon noose of the deck is uh, really highlighted as a bigger issue in these cases. Buzz Rock with Ninetales is going to be an issue as well, especially if they are starting to swing with their Alone and Ninetales and then they can use the Buzz Wall to finish things off. And even Buzz Wall can take just a one-for-one one prize off the board and you're starting to lose your setup a little bit. Spread Mally, I think, is probably a worse matchup alongside Lavatar Coco. These things really feel like lost causes, in my opinion. I feel like because they have Spell Tags and Giratina on top of all the Coco spreading that they can do, uh, Spread Mally is never going to be winnable. Uh, they can even just gust and pick up your Machokes and deal with them quite easily. And Lavatar Coco, probably more winnable than the Malamar list because they're not playing um, Spell Tags, but they're probably just going to out Flying Flip you and they have as many non-GXs as you do and their game plan will eventually just sweep the board so I feel like the spread stuff in general is going to really give you a hard time everything else I think is in your range of winning to be honest uh, if there are decks that are playing other non-GX builds hopefully you can keep up with speed and if they're playing other GXs hopefully you can again build up to that point where you're taking big one hit KOs and they're struggling to race on you so that is pretty much the long and short of it with Lost March. Which brings me to the closing thoughts. This is not Night March. That's the first thing I want to say. As hyped as everyone is for this deck, there's a lot of... I have to have a lot more criticism with it than I did with Night March because putting things in the discard pile happens naturally and it made Ultra Ball an insane... like an even more insane card. It made... You know, obviously we're in a time where the format was way quicker. The combo of Night March could happen all on turn one, and they could end their turn. If they were going second, they could theoretically end their turn taking two prizes. That's never going to happen with Lost March. Uh, even if you find all four of your Trumbeaks, you know, that's 80, right? That's no way as much as Night March used to be. So we're way slower, and we're way more vulnerable in the early game. If our Hopips start getting knocked out, our damage output depletes completely. That's why I've made the point of having two stretches in here to try and recycle them as quickly as possible because we need them. We really do need them to reach those big one-hit KOs. So uh, for everyone thinking that this is the new Night March, yes, in theory it is. It's the closest thing that we can ever say it has been, but the gameplay will feel very, very different. And that's the point I really want to drive home here. I feel like this is more sort of tier two category than tier one Night March style, at least for now, unless we get any more help for Lost March, uh, God forbid. But regardless, I think you're still, at the end of the day, the core of the deck is very simple, straightforward. Our strategy, whenever we're not up against spread, is viable. We should be able to outrace as long as we don't clunk up in the early turns, or if our hopips get targeted down too proactively. I feel like we can honestly race and reach one-hit KOs and uh, be able to outtrade, especially as we reach the mid to late game. Um, we can definitely pull out comebacks because we are so non-GX focused. But I think in general, because there are already so many decks that will naturally be playing spread, uh, Coco, even Zoro decks playing like Coco Stretcher can give you problems, to be honest, if they, uh, if you're like missing Guzmas and playing around Cat's Catcher, but just by spreading a bunch, that's going to be a headache for you. If you have a slightly slower start, the Hopips are really fragile. They have 40 hit points. They can You can just lose to... Coco spreading twice at times, so I think even if there aren't dedicated spread variants, just Coco's being inserted into things can make your matchup a lot more rough, and at the end of the day, there are lots of non-GX Pokemon that can be thrown in that do, you know, a good amount of spread damage that can cause you headaches, so I think if Night March ever rises to power, we have Shuckle, we have spread anyway, uh, so it'll naturally be kept in check for the most part. That is it though, guys, let me think, uh, let me hear your thoughts about Lost March, let me hear uh, how your builds have been going. Let me know what you think about my 60 cards. What do I need to change? Um, and all that good stuff. We'll be moving on to another Lost March deck tomorrow. So I hope you guys did enjoy and we'll see you t uh, then.